Okay. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everybody, to ECS 173, Introduction to Image Processing and Analysis. Hopefully you're all in the right room. Uh, welcome back from your summer, et cetera. Um, my name is Owen Carmichael. I'm a computer scientist. My faculty position is in the neurology department in the School of Medicine here at UC Davis. And um, I'm an assistant professor, and my most of the time is spent on research. So I do research in medical image analysis, specifically how to image the aging brain. So we do a lot of brain imaging of elderly people and how to process those images. In addition, I did graduate work in processing of photographic images and 3D surface data. And so that's where I get my expertise for teaching this course. So what I'm going to do today is give an overview of the entire course, both in terms of the contents of it, what you're going to be learning about, and kind of how the mechanics of how the course works. So feel free to interrupt at any time. Uh, I only counted 21 people, but the course is fully enrolled. So raise your hand if you are uh, enrolled, first of all. Start there. Uh, raise your hand if you are on the waiting list. Just one. OK, good. And if you are interested in auditing, OK, fine. Uh, I already told you. Uh, in general, um, if the enrollment is below the maximum, then auditing is fine. The last time I taught this course, um, we started out with 25 enrolled, which is the maximum. And it dwindled down to 20, so there were always seats for audits. So, um, But we'll monitor the uh, enrollment situation, and I'll let you know. In fact, I think I'm not allowed to in allow audits in the event that it's fully enrolled because it's a fire hazard. Uh, only 25 people are supposed to be in this room and blah, blah, blah. OK, so like I said, um, we're going to talk about both about what the course has in it in terms of the content, the intellectual content of the course, and also how it works mechanically. And then um, you know, give you kind of a broader context, which you don't always get in computer science cor courses, about why studying this thing is important, not just for bringing home a paycheck or for advancing the state of the art in something, but in a broader kind of society level sense, if you will. So let's start with uh, what image processing and analysis is. Well, if you do what I did and you go to Amazon.com and buy five or six textbooks in the computer vision, image processing, or medical image analysis, um, there's usually a preface that's written by the author of the textbook that tries to get into this question about, OK, what is the scope of this book? What is image processing? What is image analysis? What do those terms mean? And you get a couple of different points of view from these different authors. And here are just three of them. One says that image processing analysis is about computing properties of the 3D world from one or more digital images. So the idea here is that there exists a, a world out there that is innate, that is independent of whether or not we're in it, and it's independent of whether or not we are sensing anything. And we come along, and we plop down, and we have these imperfect measurement devices called eyeballs, and an imperfect, helpful uh, measurement device called a brain. And that with these imperfect measurement devices, we are trying to actually determine the innate properties of the innate world that is sitting out there independent of us. So that's from Manuel Trucco's book. So this is just like any other um, scientific measurement Question: If you want to measure someone's blood pressure, there are a number of there's a variety of different ways of doing that. None of them are perfect. No device for doing so is perfect, and so you have to worry about the science of how you measure things that are innate, like blood pressure. So another point of view is that it's really about making useful decisions about real physical objects and scenes. And so this is kind of the um, robotics point of view on image processing. So there's a whole world of people as you. I'm sure uh, have seen that uh, work on robotics, things like the Roomba, the vacuum cleaning robot, and so on. Um, and from their point of view, everything that you do in relation to your robot is a means to an end. And the end is getting the robot to interact with the real world. And so from that point of view, image processing is the process of 
faking video streams or sonar streams or radar streams that are attached to your robot and use them to make decisions about the real world. Like, for example, should you keep driving straight or should you stop and make a turn? So it's not really actually about determining what is in the world in any kind of absolute sense, but just what you should do about it. And so the third one says it's a study of methods and techniques uh, for the construction of artificial uh, vision systems. So this is more of the kind of um, uh, cookbook point of view or the theory point of view where you are presented with an abstract problem that involves images. And what you're supposed to do is come up with a uh, game plan or a set of steps that you're going to take to solve this somewhat abstract problem that may or may not be applied in, in the real world. But um, what I like to do, if someone asks me what I work on in my research or, or what image processing analysis is, I like to tell people that it's the process of, uh, it's the same problem that is solved by your brain when you describe an image over the telephone to somebody. So this used to be a much more relevant example before every person's cell phone had a camera on it. But imagine in those early days, or imagine that you're talking on the phone to your uh, great-grandmother who doesn't have a cell phone and she talks over a landline. And um, you say, I have this great photograph of my nephew. And she says, oh, what does it look like? Well, uh, and it's open-ended like that. So you say, well, you, you start listing off things. And I promise that each and every person in this room is going to be able to come up with a, not just one line, but a whole paragraph of different descriptions of this particular photograph. Uh, for the first of all, you can tell that there's a little kid in it. You can tell that he looks kind of uh, not happy or sad or angry or uh, uh, anything in particular, but he has a kind of a neutral sp uh, facial expression or surprised, if anything. Uh, a couple of the things you might notice is that in the front of the, can of the field of view, it's relatively quite bright, and in the background, it's relatively quite dark which would suggest to you that it was shot with a flash. And furthermore, based on the ripples of this thing, it's easier to see on my laptop, unfortunately, but um, based on the contours of that thing in the front, you're probably going to guess that that thing is some kind of a fabric, maybe um, linens on a bed or maybe some kind of a shirt or something like that. Furthermore, you may notice that in the background here, there's a dark gray thing with one really, really bright spot on it. That's what's known as a specularity, and it's what you use as a visual cue to tell you that something is made out of metal in a photograph. And there's a bunch of other stuff going on. There is a dumped over laundry hamper, and there are a bunch of toys. And if you look on his pants, you may notice that there are little snowmen that appear in a repeated pattern, um, and he's basically wearing snowman pajamas. So each of the things that I just told you, you could have easily told me. I'm sure of that. Um, but each of those things is a different aspect of this problem of image processing and analysis. So the boy's kneeling on the carpet. He's touching a toy fire truck and so on and so forth. It turns out that most of these things are very, very, very difficult for a computer to do automatically in any kind of general sense. And each one of the things that I've highlighted is a different sub-problem of this great problem of image processing and analysis that you could potentially spend a big chunk of your career trying to solve as a researcher if you decide to go into that. So detecting the fact that it's a boy and not a tea kettle is called object detection. Uh, describing the fact that he's kneeling on the carpet is called pose estimation. So kneeling as opposed to uh, Standing on one foot as opposed to waving your arms in the air, those are all different poses of the human body. You would think that it would be easy to automatically detect what pose objects are in. Actually quite difficult. Um, uh, the f all the stuff that I told you about how it looked like, it was photographed with a flash. Uh, that's called lighting estimation. And again, it's very difficult to do in a general setting. There's a snowman pattern on his pajamas. That's called texture estimation, visual texture. There's, we use that term in two uh, senses. Uh, tactile texture is like being able to tell that something is sandpaper based on the fact that you're touching it. Visual texture is being able to tell that something is plaid as opposed to polka dots based on uh, looking at it. But that's called texture estimation. And actually, the fact that we wear textured clothing is one of the things that makes pose estimation so difficult, by the way. Um, oh, I didn't mention this, but 
It's easier to tell on my laptop, but um, you can probably tell, even though this wall goes from fairly relatively bright here to relatively dark in the background, you can probably guess that it's all the same color and it's all a light color, like white or off-white. That's called color constancy, being able to tell the in intrinsic color of things independent of how they're lit up. And then the thing about the shiny metal bookcase is estimating material properties. So if you actually model the way, and you might even go over this in a computer graphics class, but um, if you actually try to model the way light coming from a light source like a camera flash interacts with a material like velvet, and how that gives rise to an image of a velvet coat being shot with a flash, it is tremendously complicated. And that makes this whole process of trying to uh, get a computer to automatically describe photographs over the telephone um, very, very complicated. So um, maybe to summarize, my favorite way to summarize this whole area of, of study is to say that it's about the intelligent and concise summary of the contents of images. Intelligent means that you are moving away from pixel values. In other words, if you look at a photograph, each one has a certain brightness associated with it, each pixel does. Um, getting away from all those numbers to more and more semantic notions. So, um, and concise means that you do it in a small number of pieces of information. You don't just ramble on and on and on about what is in the photograph. So, uh, this kind of begs two different questions. One is, what, what do I mean by contents? And another one is, what do I mean by images? So I'll just go through that. Um, throughout this course, you will see this slide or some version of it over and over again. And I call it a semantic uh, hierarchy or a semantic ladder. At one end are notions, concepts that are low level and very, very basic and very, very close to those pixel values. So if you snap a photograph again, the thing that's actually being stored on your mobile device or on your computer is an array of numbers, where low numbers close to zero represent dark pixels, and high numbers close to some maximum represent bright pixels. So that's at the very lowest level. That's the lowest level of information that you can actually store about images. And image processing and analysis is about pushing ourselves up this into more higher level, more semantic notions about what's in the photographs. So all the way at the highest level are really abstract, kind of subjective, cerebral notions about what is going on in an image. So this is the kind of thing that you might think about if you were in an art gallery looking at a famous painting. You might think about these kind of things, about, well, does it look elegant? Is it grim? Um, are, is it, what is the person thinking about when they make that facial expression? When we look at news photographs, this is a lot of what determines why a particular photograph gets picked for the front page of the Sacramento Bee. It's about, does it convey a particular emotion? So is it elegant, cute, grim? Advertising is a lot, is, has a lot to do with this, too. Um, a, somewhere in between an array of pixel values and this really abstract, cerebral kind of notions about what's in images are all this stuff in between. So a little bit more um, informative than just talking about pixel values is talking about, well, is the image blurry or relatively, relatively crisp? And a little bit more complicated than that is talking about, well, are there boundaries in the image? Not telling us what the boundaries are in between, but just are there dark regions that are next to bright regions? So it's, a, it's not telling you what is actually in the photograph, but it's giving you a little bit more information than just the raw pixel values. And more complicated than that is answering the question of, are there regions that are all the same color or the same texture? If I give you a photograph that has uh, someone in a plaid jacket standing uh, in front of a brick wall, can you actually tell me which pixels are on the brick wall and which pixels are on the plaid jacket? Without actually having a semantic notion of what a jacket is or what a wall is, but just telling me that they look different. So that's a little bit more semantic or a little bit more high level than, again, looking at the, the raw uh, pixel values. And then even more complex than that are 
uh, descriptions of activity. So if you see a photograph of someone who's on one leg uh, like this, you can probably tell me that they're walking or running. Um, and there's numerous other examples of that too, where you can actually get a sense of activity further away yet from the actual description at a mathematical level of whether individual pixels are dark or bright. And then, of course, what objects are in the photograph? Is there a little boy in it? Is there a fire truck? And so on. And then uh, on the medical side, we get to this high-level notion of whether the individual that you're viewing in the image is healthy or sick. And if you can answer that question, um, after many years of training as a radiologist, you have a very comfortable living ahead of you. Um, this is what radiologists do all day. They look at scans of the human body and they make decisions, they make clinical diagnoses about whether someone has a particular medical problem or not. And what they're doing in their big, well-trained brains is a very complicated process of starting with bright and dark pixels, numerical values for how bright and dark they are, and abstracting out of that all of these different properties that actually end up in an opinion about what's going on with tissues in the body. So uh, just as an anecdote about this, I worked at IBM in um, San Jose for a summer on a project back in uh, 1995 that they called the Cubic Project, Query by Image Content. And the purpose of this project was to make a product that can go through a set of photographs in a database and do some very simple querying on it. So it could tell you, uh, it could provide all of the images that had, for example, a bluish top part of the image and a brownish bottom part of the image in case you wanted to pick out photographs in a large database of people on the beach. Or if you wanted to get photographs of fish, it could give you, you could put in a little drawing of kind of a cartoon looking fish, and it could provide the set of all images in your database that looked like they had that shape in it. So they presented this thing to a group of advertising people, and um, they said, here's what we can do. We can find photographs that have certain colors in them, certain shapes in them. And the advertising people came back and said, um, well, what we really want is a computer program that will provide us images of certain things that we type into a search window. And they said, well, OK, well, what types of things? So we, want to, we want pictures of, of challenge. And they said, well, what? What does that mean, really? And what that, what that means is that the advertising people were thinking way up here on this semantic hierarchy of what they want to get out of their photographs. And the IBM people were down here. And I think um, just as kind of a very general kind of overarching rule, what's happening in the state of the art in this area is that over time, we're gradually moving our capabilities from being pretty good down here to sometimes doing a quite reasonable job of solving this problem to eventually scooting our way up in this direction. That's kind of just a broad overview of where this field in general is moving. Does it make sense? By the way, feel free to interrupt with any questions and speak into the mic, of course, if you have any. OK, so uh, in terms of images, this course is broken up into three uh, modules, which correspond to three different types of imaging data. So the first one is what you are all familiar with, photographs. So they are two-dimensional arrays of image intensities, as we've been talking about. Uh, each one either has a corresponding red, green, and blue value, or just uh, an intensity for black and white images. And, um, and they are going to comprise the first three weeks of the course and the first programming project. The second, and this didn't reproduce well at all, but the second three weeks of the course are going to deal with 3D range data. So what this amounts to, you can essentially ignore this awful picture, but what it did show was a set of points in three dimensions that are connected to each other by edges to form surfaces. And actually, this is almost like a Rorschach test, um, but that is, in fact, a plumbing part. So there's a faucet up here, and then the faucet mechanism, and then a pipe that goes out here. Um, but uh, there are numerous devices, including sonar and radar that collect this kind of data automatically, and there's a number of different tasks that you might want to solve using that data. And for people who are interested in computer graphics and games, this is really the relevant part of the course because it's very, um, uh, it's this kind, these kinds of techniques that we're going to talk about 
are big time in things like building models of um, characters and scenes from real data and using them and animating them and so on. The last three weeks of the course uh, are going to deal with volumetric medical images. And this is the standard type of data that is collected from you when you go to the hospital and get an MRI scan, a CT scan, or a PET scan. And what it is, you can think of it as being a three-dimensional array where every location in that three-dimensional array has an intensity associated with it. So what you're seeing here is a 2D rendering of a 3D data set. If you can imagine, each location in this data set uh, has a brightness associated with each point in it. Another way to think about it, if you prefer, is that it's almost like a movie in the sense that you have a set of two-dimensional images that are essentially stacked together into one cubic block. And what this is showing, by the way, is an MRI scan of someone's brain where they have artificially, this wasn't actually done to the person, but computationally we've artificially chopped off the top part of the brain and peeled back some of the skull so that you can see some of the things that are going on in this person's brain. So that's going to be the last three weeks of the course. Um, the quarter length is 10 weeks total, but we always lose a couple of days due to holidays. So pretty much this is how it's going to shake out. There might be one extra lecture day. Actually, that's the other thing I do. Is at the very end of the course, um, there's one, usually one extra lecture day, if I can do it, about kind of the, some of the societal implications of images, which are getting more and more sticky and more and more uh, complicated over time. But roughly, this is how it's going to shake out. Three weeks on photographs, three weeks on 3D surfaces, and three weeks on volumetric data. OK, so um, technically speaking, the way these images are formed makes the problems of processing volumetric images the easiest. 3D range data, harder than that. And 2D photographs, even harder than that. And the reason why I say that is that when someone takes a photograph of your head, first of all, the back of your head and the inside of your head are covered up by the front of your head if they're taking a photograph of your face. So we can't see the back of your head, and we can't see the middle of your head, and we can't even see the shape of your nose or the indentation of your eyes or the shape of your lips or anything. Um, the fact that we can't see the back of your head or the inside of your brain is called occlusion. The front of the head is occluding the back. And the fact that we get no 3D data at all, that we can't tell the how far your nose juts out or how far your lips jut out, that's called projection. It's the fact that we started with a 3D surface that's a real 3D surface, the human face, and projected it onto a two-dimensional plane called the, uh, called the CCD plane of your camera. So we've taken this 3D filled-in world and turned it into a 2D uh, flat thing. 3D range data, you still have the occlusion problem. So if I do a 3D scan of my face, yes, you will be able to capture what the relative shape of my nose is and the relative indentation of my eye sockets and things, but you still won't be able to see the inside of my brain. So the, 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 the problem of occlusion is still there, but the problem of projection has gone away with 3D data. And... Uh, with volumetric medical images, on the other hand, you get the whole shebang. You get the inside of my brain, you get the shape of my nose, you get how my face looks, you get how the back of my head looks, the whole thing. And so the additional problems of occlusion and projection are what make uh, add a lot of the complications to processing of photographs and processing of range data. OK, so here are just some example, really canonical problems from image processing that uh, have gotten a great deal of attention and are very prominent in this uh, line of work. So here is a really textbook example from the 1990s and early 2000s. You're given a photograph that's a general photograph. It may or may not have people in it. And what I want you to do is automatically localize all of the faces in it, all the human faces. So the algorithm that worked on this image did a good job because it placed these squares over all of the faces that you see in the photograph. And it didn't put any faces over here on the refrigerator. So if it had missed some faces and said, nope, that face is not a face at all, that would be called a false negative. 
And if it had said, this thing over here is a face when it's actually a refrigerator, that would be called a false positive. So that, those are the two th errors that you're trying to do away with when you uh, detect faces in photographs. Um, the, by far the best algorithms for doing this are almost certainly owned by the military and the intelligence community, but there's been a great deal of work in the academic setting on this too. So, um, for example, there are a few different brands of, um, uh, of uh, photographic print developers, so if you actually wanted to take your digital photos and make prints out of them, uh, that on board have a face detector for automated removal of red eye effects. Because it turns out that if you just try to detect eyes by themselves, there's a lot of things that look like eyes. But if you first detect faces and then look for the eye within the face, you actually do a pretty good job. Uh, another example problem, which again gets back to this, um, some applications in computer games and computer graphics, is if I have an object here and I want to animate this thing in a movie, what I can do is have a range scanning device like this one and hold it in front of this range scanning device and take a set of range photographs, which is to say a set of 3D surfaces of different points of view of this object. But I'm just kind of moving them around free form. I'm not keeping track of the relative orientation of the object in each scan. So what I end up with is a set of 3D surfaces that are completely disorganized, but they all cover the same object, or they're all different aspects of the same object. So what I want to do is put those things together and fuse them together into a unified, complete 3D model that covers the entire object, and optionally also has the uh, texture information, how the thing looks. So in this way, you can imagine uh, very simply taking a set of photographs and ending up with this 3D model, which you can then animate and put into games and so on and so forth. So it's another canonical problem from this field. Uh, another problem is, and this comes from the medical world obviously, is given an MRI scan of a human head, what the thing that I'm really interested in is the brain. Not the skull, not the sinus cavities, not the eyeballs, but the brain. So what I want to do is automatically remove the brain from the rest of the stuff around it, including the skull. And this is just a video that my former undergrad, Gotham, made where he models the brain as the thing that's inside an ellipse, and he scoots the ellipse around until the thing that's inside the ellipse looks like the brain as separate from the skull and the sinuses and so on. Solving this problem sounds relatively simple, but in a general case, we've applied it to thousands of scans, by the way, it breaks. And so it's hard to solve this thing in any kind of general way so that it works relatively, uh, say, all the time or most of the time. Um, one of the unfortunate things about this field of study is that there is a terminology problem. So um, you may hear people refer to 3D vision as a, uh, as a field of study. Computer vision, machine vision, and robot vision, all of these terms are synonymous. And all of them are kind of used in, by different individuals. And so they all mean the same thing. Don't try, to, don't try to disambiguate them. Similarly, image processing, image analysis, image understanding, image interpretation, they're all synonymous. And they're all synonymous with computer vision and 3D vision and machine vision and so on. Um, different people draw different distinctions between the uh, processing of general signals whether they are from Im images or sound or other uh, devices, and they call that signal processing. So there is kind of a gray dividing line between the general processing of signals and, and, and that applied specifically to images, but none of these correspond to that. So these are all about actually starting with photographic data or range data or medical data and, and processing it. And similarly, medical, medical image analysis and medical image processing are synonymous and refer to, more specifically, to, obviously, to medical images. And then, as I said, signal processing is more of a low-level general study of, uh, of processing signals in a general sense. Okay, so um, here's how the course works. There are lectures Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 1 to 2 in this room. Discussion section follows it on Friday um, from 2 to 3. 
And I assume they do that because we have a distant student um, at Livermore. Uh, the TA is Jing Jai. Sorry, Jing, I'm going to point you out. She's in the back, in the middle there. She will be leading discussion section. Um, my office hours are 2 to 4 Monday in, in Academic Surge, which is, um, how am I oriented here? It's that way. Just uh, two buildings down, kind of kitty corner to Boehner Hall, or kitty corner to Kemper Hall, more or less, sort of. Uh, and Jing will be deciding her own office hours, and they will be held in that room. Um, so um, there will be three programming projects. I may have said that already. One having to do with photographs, one having to do with 3D surface data, one having to do with volumetric medical images. And there will be uh, exams, which I will talk about. And if you are a graduate student, you can do a term paper to use this course for graduate credit. And we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, there are readings to do, which I'll get into. And there's a course website on uh, SmartSite, which I have not yet updated. So I'll get that done by Monday. But uh, there's a load of stuff on, on SmartSite for you to look at. So uh, at, on SmartSite is where you will upload your homework solutions. You can download lecture slides and discussion section slides. Um, what I'm going to do, I've done this in the past, is that um, in the beginning of the quarter, I load all of two years ago's versions of the slides on a smart site so that if you feel compelled to read ahead, you can do so. But the understanding is that I'm going to make minor changes to the slides as I actually do the lectures and update them as I go along. So if you read ahead to next week's slides and you see something about uh, the midterm, you should ignore it because it's about two years ago's midterm. Um, right, so let me go into some of those in, in detail. So uh, the lectures, uh, what I try to do is since I have about nine to ten weeks, I try to dedicate each week to its own uh, big sub area of image processing and analysis. And so each lecture tries to give an overview of an image processing topic. And usually the way it works is that on Monday, you get a big, broad overview of a particular area. And then Wednesday and Friday, we go into more depth into that thing. So if you come on Monday, you will get the broad overview of the state of the art in that particular area. And we'll talk about key aspects of this problem of the week, why it matters, what the current solutions are to the problem. And also, um, I don't want to make anything sound like it's a done deal. So there are difficulties and limitations to everything in image processing nowadays. And so we'll talk about those and talk about what the open problems are. And like I said, every week is going to be a kind of uh, seminal or canonical area of image processing. Uh, the three programming projects, I think this is somewhat typical. But um, what they do is they start with a basic or dumb system for solving a particular, meta, uh, a particular image processing problem. So the first one, for example, is a uh, system for modeling the appearance of human faces. And you start out with a solution that is dumb. It doesn't do it very well. And your job is to start with this skeleton code that I give you that does things like evaluates how well a system models the appearance of the human face. And then you upgrade it. So your job is going to be to uh, implement upgrades that make the thing work better based on what I tell you in lecture and partly based on some things from the readings. So um, you will implement improvements. And then you will analyze the performance of the dumb system and the better system. And, um, and I think the thing that I'm really looking for in the project solutions is not whether or not your program solution knocks the socks off of the dumb baseline system, but whether or not you understand why your solution does or does not outperform the baseline system. And so, for example, some people who have gotten A's on programming projects in the past have actually tried to improve the image, the, the face modeling system, failed to do so, and said, well, here's why my program solution failed. Data, 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 reasoning, 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 conclusion. So that's perfectly fine. And in fact, I tried to keep it open-ended so that 
if you want to try a particular solution that you think is interesting, go ahead and do it. Uh, and there's a kind of a whole space of different ways to uh, improve these systems. Because really, I think um, when it comes time for you guys to go and start a job in computer science somewhere, that's probably how it's going to shake out, is that someone's going to give you a problem to solve and not tell you exactly how to program it. So I think this is good, good kind of um, concrete practice in how to do that. All of the programming projects take advantage of the Insight Toolkit, which is a set of C++ classes that implement various aspects of image processing functionality. It was developed by the National Library of Medicine, um, and along with it was, was developed a set of ancillary tools that do things like configuration management. In fact, many of you may be familiar with the CMake configuration management system. It was actually developed as the thing that spits out make files for your Insight Toolkit application, but it turned out to be so useful that it was that it got bigger than that and bled out and started to be useful for a variety of other projects. So each kind of technique or each method for doing some aspect of, of image processing um, is implemented as a templated C++ class. So this is one thing that people who have gotten into trouble in this class in the past, probably about 85% of those problems have been in learning how to program with ITK. So um, uh, uh, writing code in C++ is already kind of semi-hairy with all the different things you have to keep track of, templates, inheritance, operator overloading especially. Um, and this is, this is that on steroids. This is every program you write is going to be templated, operator overloaded, inherited C++. So um, that's why every discussion section holds your hand through how to write different types of Insight Toolkit code. So for that reason, if any of you um, are double booked for some reason and can't make any of the discussion sections, um, I, it's OK and you can do it. But you had better be a really, really good programmer. And I mean like gangster. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Um, so what else? This is just an example of some of the things that you can do. If you're familiar with ITK, you can uh, implement a processing pipeline in ITK in a snap by using some of their pre-existing uh, pre functionality. So they have uh, a C++ class that reads in data like this, that smooths it out, that extracts edges from it, and that can break it up into regions. So all of these steps, uh, you know, they already exist inside ITK. And for the most part, solving your problem in image processing is a combination of just putting together pre-existing pieces and then adding your own little chunks on top of it. So that's probably going to be the bulk of your time in the course it, in terms of the programming part of it. So it has this pipeline concept. The classes are templated so you can use different types of imaging data, and by that I mean integer as opposed to float, as opposed to double precision, and so on. You can plug and play different steps together. And um, uh, one of the most worrisome things about C++, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is that uh, memory management is a huge pain, and that problems with memory management are completely opaque to you until you stay up all night and track it down. Um, ITK has this nice thing called reference counting, which means that it keeps track of, for every block of memory, whether or not something in your code is pointing to it. And if nothing is pointing to it, it's automatically deallocated. So you don't have to do, you have to do news, but you don't have to do deletes, which is, for me anyway, this was like a revelation. Because I've, I've been that guy many, many times who has staying up all night tracking down his memory management problem in his C++ code. Uh, CMake we already talked about. There's a thing called cable swig, although your mileage may vary. I don't actually have my own personal experience with it. It's a set of Python, Tickle, I don't want to say Perl too. Anyways, the ones that I'm sure about are Python and Tickle that wrap around these C++ classes. And um, 
I encourage you to use it because um, the things that I know about um, Python make it sound like it's really preferable to doing things in, in C++. But anyway, uh, visuals, I don't know why that's so small, but Visualization Toolkit is the visualization side to this, so it provides tools for visualizing imaging data. Um, and it was written by the same people who wrote ITK. So the idea was that it, they wanted to make it easy for you to read in imaging data, mess with it, and then display it on a screen. And Deoxygen was another one of these software packages that was developed specifically for Insight Toolkit and then bled out into a bunch of other um, areas. It's a system for automatically generating um, HTML documentation from your source code. And it can do, it can do neat things like parse your um, C++ class declaration and get inheritance diagrams saying what the base class is and what the kids are and what the kids of those kids are. And pretty nice if you know how to use it. There's also an a active user community uh, that is always contributing help and new classes. And it's, it's also, um, but, well, it was funded extensively by the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, in the first place. But also it's, it's also the current industry standard for at least medical image analysis. Oops. Um, and it's getting into other areas of image processing, too. So uh, the programming projects are a, a system for modeling human faces and detecting them aligning range data scans, and automatically doing what I showed you in that example movie, which is automatically, it's called skull stripping. It's getting the skull and the other non-brain tissue away from the brain in a medical image. So uh, you'll turn in the code and the documentation on smart site, and we will compile and run your code and make sure it does something reasonable. In addition to obviously looking through your report and and looking at your reasoning and, and how you think. So the discussion sections, as I've said already, are tutorials on ITK, how to do stuff in ITK. Yeah, you can also ask questions about the lecture material also. That's fine. But I think the main usefulness of it is going to be this Insight Toolkit thing. Uh, not required, but like I said, it's a really good idea, unless you are some kind of master level uh, computer programmer. The two exams, I haven't picked a date for the midterm, and I didn't look up the date for the final exam, but um, the midterm is going to be in the middle of the quarter, obviously. And what they do is ask you to describe image processing problems, algorithms, solutions, and holes in current solutions. So what I'm trying to do is not figure out whether you memorize something or not, but how you are thinking about an image processing problem. And this gets back to that issue of, uh, what you're going to do when you get out of college, and and uh, and you know, in particular, I'm going to present you with a problem in this ex in these exams, and say, here's a problem. How would you solve it? And so, in order to do that, you're going to have to really synthesize your understanding of the lecture material, especially the lecture slides, and uh, put them together into some kind of a solution for problem. Or I might say, here's a problem. Give me two different solutions. Or another uh, popular type of test question is, um, I have been given a problem, and I'm not very bright, and I've come up with the following deficient solution. What's deficient about my solution? So this leans very heavily on the lecture slides. So it makes a lot of sense to come to lecture. And uh, it leans less on the recommended readings. So uh, grad students, I think there are at least there's a couple that I know of. Um, if you want to use this course for graduate credit and you are in the computer science graduate group, you can do so by um, writing a term paper. But talk to me about it first. Um, it's, it's still a misconception that, that graduate students don't want to take this course because they think they can't use it for their graduate degree. But since most people are not graduate students, just if you're a grad student and you want to use this for graduate credit, just talk to me. Um, there are no good textbooks for this course, okay? So that's why the U book is um, recommended reading, and the Forsyth book is also recommended. But neither of them put together all the material in this course into one nice package. 
So that's why I don't require a textbook, because it would be a ripoff no matter what I did. Um, so uh, and the common thing is to have a textbook that talks about photographs and video, uh, a textbook that talks about volumetric medical images extensively, and one or the other of those textbooks might have a chapter on range data. So uh, none of them are, are sufficient, and so that's why I basically lean very heavily on the lecture slides and also recommend you and Forsyth. Uh, Forsyth is probably the best one for photographs and video. And it, it has a little bit of ra on range data, but not a lot. Um, and the U book, of course, is very tightly linked to ITK. So it talks about the algorithms that are implemented in ITK, in fact. So um, there's a couple of other PDFs. There's not that many that try to fill in some gaps. And um, only the scanned PDFs and the lecture slides are required. So the recommended books are just, well, like the, they're recommended. So they might increase your understanding of these things. Um, okay, so um, I already talked about this. Officially register for the course or get on the waiting list if you want to get in. Um, and auditing is fine if there's enough seats. So um, by Monday, you should be able to go to a smart site and be able to get a, um, a survey, which you can fill out to talk about what you want to learn about. <clears throat> um, you can get the syllabus, and you can look at the course, sound, the course calendar. I request that everybody fill out a course survey by a week from today so that if there's a big, mass, overwhelming number of people who want to learn about a particular topic, then I change up the lecture material and talk about that thing. But it's up to you. I mean, you don't, it's not required for your grade to fill in the survey, but it's in your own best interest in the sense that if you want to learn about something, you may have the opportunity to make me teach it to you. So please do so. Uh, let's see. Any questions about the administrative stuff for the course? OK, well, um, oh, yeah, just a couple of other things that are kind of, you know this already, but I have to say them out loud. You know, uh, Don't distribute the lecture slides to anybody. They're, um, they include a lot of copyrighted content, and um, my access to that copyrighted material did not include distribution. So don't hand them out. Um, and if you try to pass off non-original code as your own, uh, you can't do that. And um, I, but the thing that makes that a slightly complicated is that you will be handed skeleton code already, OK? So I will make it very clear where you are expected to contribute your own code as opposed to not. And also, the fact that there's a lot of stock ITK code existing makes this a little bit complicated. So if you are at all unclear as to whether you can use a pre-existing ITK class for something as opposed to you have to write it all yourself, do ask Jing or myself, just because I don't want anybody to be unclear about what is considered plagiarism versus not. Um, and all programming assignments are done individually. So um, no, there's no team assignments for this course. I only have about, what, two minutes? So I'm going to zoom through why image processing is important. And uh, on your free time, you can then go through these in more depth to, uh, to figure it out for yourself. So in medicine, you may have heard that Bo Jackson is working on his third or fourth artificial hip. And the reason for that, partially, is that placing the ball part of the hip joint relative to how, sorry, the, the, the socket part of the hip joint relative to the ball part of the artificial hip bone in such a way that you don't pop the ball out of the socket is relatively hard and re requires precise instrumentation to figure out where to put it. And image processing is what allows you to very carefully model the 3D structure of the bone and the cup and the ball so that they're all in the right place as you sew the person back up. Um, this photograph, let's see, 1995. So this, you were alive at this point. Um, does anyone recognize this, by the way, what this is a surveillance video of? No, it's not L.A. Did I put, hmm? Oklahoma? Yes, Oklahoma City. So this is the um, 
uh, surveillance video from the Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City. That rider truck was driven by Timothy McVeigh. Uh, <clears throat> the back was filled with an improvised explosive that he manufactured out of fertilizer. And he basically parked the truck there, walked away, detonated it. Building collapsed, 200 people died. And um, part of the reason that they were able to convict him is that they were able to analyze this surveillance video and do what's called super resolution, which means take a set of blurry video of photographs in a video and enhance them in order to be able to tell that there's an identifying number on this truck somewhere that identifies it as the one that he rented. So for these kinds of reasons, image processing can be important in a big sense. I will skip that and just um, say one more thing, which is about in psychology, your face gives you away most of the time. People can tell whether you are laughing at a joke because you are expected to laugh at a joke or because you actually think it's funny. So if your boss tells a joke, you're liable to laugh at it because that person's your boss. And it turns out, psychologists have figured out by analyzing videos of facial expressions as someone's reacting to something, that it's all in your eyes. So your eye muscles are what subconsciously laugh at a joke that you actually think is funny. And if you don't think it's funny, then just your mouth will laugh at it. And your face is actually full of a multitude of these kinds of nonverbal cues, which can be analyzed by, by analyzing face videos. So there are a number of other different applications, but I'm out of time. So I'll stop there. And I'll see you guys on Monday. <laughs>